An innocent night at the carnival turns into an evening of unspeakable horrors when two little boys follow another into a house in a neighborhood they've never been to. A house that appears to be abandoned. And they are right. Nothing lives there. But that's only half of the story. What's that? You want to be scared? Come with me. Experience tales of horror, ghosts, and death. It is not recommended for the weak at heart. Listen in the dark. It's more fun that way. This is Weekly Spooky. Hello, my spookies. It's Wednesday. And you know what that means. It's time for a little spooky in your weekly. I'm your narrator and host, Enrique Kuto, and I can't lie. Boy, am I tired. This is the 32nd day in a row that we've published Weekly Spooky. But hey, it was absolutely worth it to have an unforgettable Halloween season. And a lot of that is thanks to you listening. So... If you're brand new, happy to see you. If you've been listening for a while, thanks for coming back and make sure you're subscribed on your favorite podcasting apps. Well, tonight we have quite a scary story. This one submitted by a listener who goes by the name A.N. Ominous. I know, I know. I wish I'd came up with it, but I didn't. If you have a story you'd like us to consider for the show, just email it to Weekly Spooky at gmail.com and we'll be sure to give it a look I also want to say a happy Dia de Muertos to those who celebrate and observe as I will be today that's why this ghost story is extra extra appropriate so get yourself comfortable this one it'll give you some chills and if you want to check out more of what we do head over to weeklyspooky.com you'll find every bit of information you could ever hope for about our program and how you can support us, whether it's financially or simply by leaving us reviews on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We really do appreciate those five-star ratings. They help new spookies join the fun. And speaking of joining the fun, if you head over to Facebook and type in Weekly Spookies Tomb of Terror, it's a little Facebook group where you can hang out with all the other authors and fans and have a scary good time. But speaking of scary... It's getting dark out. I think it's about time for our story. So, turn off the lights, and we'll be presenting it to you right after these quick words. Ghost Story by A. N. Ominous I remember it as if it were yesterday. I was young. I was young enough to taste the adventure, but old enough to know better. I'm still not sure how this was real. Too much happened and was seen to be the fanciful imagination of being young. One thing is for certain. I have not forgotten what happened that night. And I am certain I never will. It was fall. The leaves were just starting to turn. The days were still warm and the nights were getting cooler. The county fair had been in full swing and was the last night it was open. I was there because a friend had talked me into going and I wanted to sample some kettle corn and caramel apples there. I was waiting in line for the popcorn when we saw him. He was a boy about my age and my size. He looked like any other boy there except his clothes were... funny. He looked like he was dressed up in old-time movie clothes. He was looking at us. My friend nudged me and nodded in his direction. We exchanged looks and began to walk toward him. As we began to walk, to my surprise, so did he, directly for us, without looking away. When we were within speaking distance, I nodded and said, Hey! He nodded back and said, Hello, my name is Jonathan. I'm from here, but have been elsewhere for a while. I don't know anyone here now. 
I told him he could go with us if he wanted to. He nodded. We spent the next couple of hours riding the roller coaster, the Ferris wheel, and the tilt-a-whirl, after which I thought I might hurl, but I managed to keep things together. We had found a bench to sit. Jonathan and my friend were working on some red vines when he asked if we liked scary things. We looked at each other and said, of course, as if we would reply any other way. He asked if we knew where the house was down on Oak Street. He said he knew the house that was spooky down there. I was hesitant, but after some encouragement from Jack, we were soon headed out the gates from the fair into the night. As we made our way down through some neighborhood streets, it had really began to cool off and there was definitely a chill in the air. A breeze was picking up and a few leaves were blowing in between our feet as we walked. We were beginning to get far enough away from the fair now that I began to become uncomfortable with the distance, even though I knew where we were. It was just then when he said, We're here. This had startled me as I realized we had all been walking in silence. A glance from Jack told me he was no more at ease than I was. I had this strange feeling of foreboding and in retrospect, I know now that my survival instinct was trying to warn me. As I looked at him, he stood looking up at it. The house was huge. I can't believe I had never noticed it before. It was a sprawling three-story mansion with what appeared to have been a large yard all around it. It seemed to be well kept, but everything about it repelled me. I looked at Jack and the other boy. Jack was looking around nervously. The boy, though, he had a radiant smile on his face. I noted he was actually breathing hard. I asked him if he was all right. He snapped his head towards me instantly while taking a step toward me. Yes, he said, then slowly retreated one step back again. What do you think? he asked. Jack was barely audible when he answered. I don't think we should go in if that's what you mean. Of course we should go in. I know who lives here. They aren't there yet, he said. I agreed with Jack and voiced my concern with getting into trouble. There will be no trouble. Let's just go, the boy said. And with that, he began to walk up the walkway to the front door. I thought the walk to that front door was the longest 25 feet of my life. Every step forward seemed to get colder. The darkness enveloped us, and the air seemed to become still. The repulsion I felt going forward was immense and progressive. I didn't know why I felt like this. I didn't want to seem scared, but I was, and I didn't know why, which made me confused on top of the anxiety I seemed to be becoming overwhelmed with. I was following the new friend of ours and Jack. The boy seemed to be bursting with enthusiasm and excitement as Jack and I trudged along. As we approached the steps up, I took hold of the rail and realized my palms were sweating profusely. I became aware of my own labored breathing. I looked to Jack who mouthed, No, at me, as we were almost to the top step on the porch. My mouth was dry as I thought of a hundred reasons not to open the large front door, but couldn't utter a single word. The boy stood in front of the door and turned to look at me. He simultaneously reached for the knob and turned it. I yelled, No! as he did, but to no avail, as we heard the click and the door began to swing open. The door creaked and groaned in a way that sounded guttural as he swung it open wide. I could see inside into the middle of the room, but the darkness swallowed the perimeter beyond. Come in, was all he said as he boldly stepped in without looking back. Without a word, Jack and I followed him in. The smell was overwhelming as we stepped inside. It smelled musty, earthy, and almost rotten, like a trunk that had been closed for years. I thought the windows looked broken out in places, but there was no air moving through the house now. I don't remember the door shutting, 
but I felt the uncontrollable urge to run, and I backed right into the shut door. Jack, in a panic, grabbed the handle and wrenched on it, but it didn't budge. He pulled with increased fervor, and I began to hit the door with my closed fist, and my hands began to tingle. I swung around to see the boy standing, looking at us, expressionless. A smile began to creep into the corners of his mouth. This twistedly sick look he began to have made the terror well up even more. As I began to scream at him, he suddenly turned and ran into the darkness, laughing maniacally. I followed a few steps after him instinctively until I realized that giggling, he ran down the stairs. Down the stairs seemed to be even blacker than the darkness that already left navigating nearly impossible. I turned to look at Jack, who was gone. I cried out in fear and frustration at our stupidity. Why would you ever go somewhere with someone you don't know? Yet here I am. Jack stepped forward into my field of vision and grabbed my arm. He began to sob. What's going on? Where did he go? Why is this place so scary? What's going on? I pulled him in and put my arm around his shoulder. Look at me. We are going to get out of here. I said in as calm of a voice as I could muster. I looked to the side to a window and ran to it. I ripped the floor-length velvet curtains open and gasped to see a window. I looked next to me to see a small table and picked it up and banged it on the glass. I wasn't sure what was going on yet, but I wasn't fully committed to breaking out a window because I'm scared. This could be a prank done on poor taste. Fear overwhelmed my rational thoughts, and I swung it. It didn't budge, and I felt as though I were hitting stone. I was even more scared at this abnormal response. I backed up one step and swung as hard as I could to have the table splinter apart, with pieces smashing against the walls, floor, and into my head. I felt the point of impact to reveal on my head a spot of blood on my hand. The window appeared unblemished. As I frantically turned to see Jack crumple into a pile on the floor crying, I want to go home. I grabbed his collar and pulled him to his feet. I went into the first open door I saw aside from the staircase. That boy must be in on this. I don't know why he would bring us here, but you can be sure it's not good. I whispered as I pulled Jack along, who was now regaining his composure. The doorway opened into a large room. It appeared to be a library. As books lined the walls to high windows which must have been three stories tall as there were balconies with ladders circumnavigating the room. I pulled us to one side as it seemed to offer a mirage of protection versus being in the room's center. I put a hand against the shelf and looked at the books. Most of the titles were in languages I didn't even recognize, some with what appeared to be symbols only. Breathing hard and looking around for the next move, I noticed there were mounted heads of animals surrounding the room. They were high above the books on the walls. Deer, bear, cougar. They did not have content looks on their faces, rather anger or fear. I looked to the next and found the animal to be beyond description, I stared at its cavorted face and studied it for a moment. It was unknown to me. I glanced ahead and found another unrecognizable head. Upon closer look, I gasped and nearly threw up. It was the head of what looked to be a person, but it had hair all over its face. Its simian likeness was unmistakable, yet it seemed more human. Jack was gasping at me, looking wildly in the direction I had been staring, yelling, What is it? He pulled at me to follow him, and I stumbled along. We came to a hallway with opposing doors. At the far end was a door with windows on either side. Long velvet curtains hung parted in the middle, showing the moonlight peeking through. We took pensive steps towards the first door, and I reached out to turn the knob. I cautiously edged the door open and peeked inside. It was too dark to make anything out visually, but I heard sounds. It sounded like something. Some kind of animal was stepping in something wet and sludge-like, 
Grunting and labored breaths intermixed with ripping sounds came from somewhere within the room. A barely audible whimper was immediately stopped by a low growl. It was then Jack stepped back and a squeak of the floorboard suddenly alerted whatever was in there. There was a rustling of something moving toward us and I knew beyond any doubt that I did not want to know what was making that noise. I was able to get us out and slam the door before the thing could get there. Jack was whispering how badly he wanted to leave and clutching my arm in a near frantic manner. I was unsure if we should look in any more rooms or go try to escape from one of the windows at the end of the hall. As I was gathering my wits, I heard another moan. I thought it might have been my imagination, but Jack's face registered that he had heard it as well. Was that the other boy? He asked in a whisper. I don't know, I replied as my voice broke. I had never and have not since known fear such as this. Sweat dripped off my nose running down my neck and back. I was shaking and could barely speak. I had thrown up again after shutting that door. It just hadn't registered until now. I wiped at my face and it was apparent I had not been aware enough to make any attempt to project it away from my body. I had a sudden recall that I had my cell phone. Funny how I had argued how I wanted and needed one with my parents and used the safety reason. How ironic, I thought, as I frantically dug it from my pocket. No service. As I thought my spirit couldn't drop farther, the date under the time seemed to be spinning, like a dial. I had no idea what had happened, but the realization it was broken almost made me cry. If we made it out of there, my parents would kill me for breaking it. I was truly terrified as the tears began to run down my cheeks. I was breathing fast and hard. My head was spinning like I may pass out. Jack's sudden grip on my arm again brought my attention back to reality. We must have been moving the last few moments as we were standing in front of the next door, which, unfortunately, was open. There was a shaft of moonlight coming from the window across the room and it fell on two of the dirtiest, foulest dogs I had ever seen. My mouth fell open in utter shock at the putrescence of them. They seemed to have what looked like some rotting skin in places. One looked like it was partially disemboweled and something drug on the floor a short distance behind it. The first one lowered his head with a growl and saliva, or something like it, dripped from the large fangs. It momentarily glistened in the little light present. The smell coming from them was nauseating. Sickly sweet rotting stench with sulfuresque tones burned my nose as I immediately recoiled from sight and smell. The closer animal, if you could call it that, began to growl although the sound seemed to emanate from the hole in its side. I pushed Jack ahead of me as panic again rose in me like a wave commanding me to run. In spite of the pathetic creature's aberrant appearance, they could move quickly. Their claws dug to gain purchase on the old floor, shredding with each foot strike. There were snarling, jaws snapping, making saliva fling and spray in the moonlight. Our complete terror must have been adrenaline-fueled enough as they were nearly to the end of the hall before I realized it. There was a perpendicular hall at the end by the windows, and as Jack was slowing to make a turn, I heard the hounds had stopped or slowed. I turned to look, and they had stopped twenty feet back and were crouching down with tails tucked between their legs, whining, and were turning back as though they were afraid of something. I called to Jack as quietly as possible to get his attention without drawing further alert to our presence. We were stopped by the windows and I looked out. My parents were walking down the street. My heart soared as I hit the window, screaming their names, completely throwing caution to the wind. They couldn't hear and kept going as there was no way for them to know I was here. I was supposed to be at the fair. How sorry I was that I hadn't done as I had said. I was going to die in this house. 
I didn't know what this place was, but it was so much worse than anything I had conjured up as a haunted house in my head. I would have given anything to be with my parents right now. Safe. Not here in this terrible place, whatever this was. I looked down the hall and at the far end was what looked like an old servant staircase, narrow and steep going down. Wanting to go anywhere but down, I looked the other way and saw a door at the far end and doors on opposing sides down the hall. More doors made fear well up inside me again. The hair began to stand up on my neck. There was a faint crying sound that was slowly growing louder. Was it a child? A woman? Was it the boy? I couldn't tell, but as it grew louder and louder, it became more... distorted. It was a mixture of crying that was morphing from a cry to laughter with choking intermixed. I had never heard a sound like that before, and if I never do again, it would be a blessing. My fear was already overcoming me, and this wretched cacophony was more than I could take. I began to pull Jack to follow me, and we began to run. We sprinted into the hallway blindly in terror. I frantically grabbed at doorknobs to open one, any one of them in hopes to get refuge from this horror. The light was so low I could barely make out the shapes of the doors. The illumination was minimal, and the color of the walls and doors appeared to be various shades of black. I scraped and padded around what I thought was a door and scrambled along. As I jabbed and reached, as I searched, I felt my fingertip catch on something sharp and my skin hooked on to whatever nail or splinter protruded. I felt the warm fluid spread and drip. As I felt the casing for the knob, I felt my fingernail pull off entirely in my nearly crazed search for a way out. The dark hall seemed to lighten slightly. The sound was still screeching, crying laughter constantly, escalating to the point I thought my ears might burst. I felt Jack hitting at me and looked where he was staring. Coming down the hall was something I think no mortal man was meant to see. It was distorted and terrible, flowing with a jerking quality simultaneously. I was suddenly captivated at the indescribable sight approaching. It was sinister, abhorrent, and mesmerizing. I knew if it reached us, all was lost. My hand found the knob that was freezing cold. I turned it. As we fell back with the door opening, I turned quickly to survey and found we were trapped in a closet. In a completely reactionary measure, I slammed the door just as the specter reached us. It roared with an intensity that seemed impossible. It slammed into the door with such violence that shards of wood, dust, and material blew out of the wall, spraying down on us. For an unknown but seemingly endless time, the torrent of anger and pure rage continued to pound upon the door, and I do not know how it did not breach it. At some point it stopped. If possible, the sudden silence was even more deafening. Jack continued to lay on the floor next to me as I lay curled in the fetal position. After an indeterminate amount of time, I began to notice a light coming from under the door. I thought it looked like sunlight. I moved over and tried to peer under. I could see what looked like daylight on the old red carpet. I looked and listened and could perceive nothing outside the door. I reached up and turned the knob. With a creak that was the defining noise of every haunted house ever, the door opened. The hallway was lit with the earliest rays of the beautiful morning sun. It was such a welcome sight to the soul sucking pitch black of the previous night. As I took in the sunshine, movement in the hall caught my attention, and I recoiled back. The sunlight was just peeking over the horizon through the windows, leaving shadows in between each one. The far end of the hallway was bathed in darkness to the door and beyond. The terrible apparition was hovering just at this boundary of light and dark. It was almost too much for my mind, and I thought I might pass out. It screamed and raged against this boundary, seething and pacing back and forth. 
It seemed to strain with all its will until the last bit of darkness was abolished with the wonderful sunlight. There was an implosion of sound with some sort of vapor or smoke, and when it dissipated, there was a single sheet with two eye holes cut out, perched at the end of the hall where it had been. It seemed almost comical, a cruel and mocking reminder that it was not gone, not truly. We eventually came to the realization that we were able to escape the house only after we passed by the classic ghost. I felt taunted and bullied by it. I wanted to knock it over but was so repelled by it I couldn't bring myself to touch it. I didn't and don't know what was under the sheet. We made our way through the house. There was no resistance. Windows were broken out, exterior doors left open, absent in some places. As we exited the house, we saw a passing police car and waved it down. The officer listened to both of us trying to relay the story, and he became suddenly very excited when he heard our names. We fell silent as he told us that we had been reported missing six days ago, and the entire town had been searching for us. Come to find out, the authorities had actually presumed us dead. My parents were out looking for me when I had seen them. My head beginning to spin was the last thing I remember that day. I'm not sure how many people believed us, if anyone. Jack and I drifted apart as I think both of us couldn't bear the memories of that night. Although, thankfully, I have never had another experience such as this. I will never forget that ghost stories aren't always fun. Well, my spookies, I think we've started November properly with that scary story. And I do mean scary story, a classic traditional story of the unknown bringing great fear to the innocence of children. That's about as campfire story as you can get. And that's the kind of stuff that makes me love what I do here at Weekly Spooky. And I know you do too, and I thank you for it. And I want to let you know this Friday we'll be publishing a compilation of our last four Thanksgiving stories. And of course, on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we'll be doing a brand new one for you. So make sure you're subscribed so you can check all that out. As we enter into the fourth year of Weekly Spooky... I want to remind you, you can send me an email at weeklyspooky at gmail.com if you have suggestions, thoughts, opinions of any sort. I want to hear them. I assure you, I'm not afraid of interaction. You can also interact with us on Spotify and leave comments on episodes. I read every comment left over at Spotify, and I do appreciate it. And if you want to support us in a financial way, you can go to weeklyspooky.com and click on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you help the show continue going and going, and you get an exclusive story every month to go with it. And I want to say an extra special thank you to our Patreon podcast boosters, folks who pay just a little bit more to hear their names on the show. And they are Johnny Nix, Bobbletopia.com, Megan Hua, Julia Kirsch, Brent McCullough, Steve King, Karen Wiemet, Jack Kerr, and Craig Cohen. Thank you all so much for the support. I really do appreciate it. And now... I am going to take a much-needed day off, my first day off of podcasting in about 50 days. But it was worth it. It was worth it to have the coolest, funnest, and spookiest Halloween of my life. And I hope we helped you have a good one, too. So for myself, for my executive producer, Rob Fields, for my producer, Dan Wilder, and our composer, Ray Mattis, I will talk at you very soon. So stay spooky, but stay safe, but also stay spooky. (laughs) Thank you for listening. Make sure to find your way back next week. But for now, you are safe. Trust me.